<laughs> Isabel is an international water advocate, speaker, activist, and educator. She's been studying water for 12 years and teaching about water for six years in six countries. She's the president of the American Water Trust, founder of waterislife.love, an advisor for the Water Innovation Accelerator, and on the faculty at the Extreme Wellness Academy. Isabel, welcome to the Biohacking Secret Show. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure and an honor to be here. <laughs> so how did you get so deep into water? Because we're going to talk about dehydration. We're going to talk about some of the ways to structure and crystallize water. But this isn't a path that is, uh, uh, is, is common, let's say. Unfortunately, you're right. It's not. And yet it feeds into just about every other path, whether someone's into nutrition or ecology or politics or economic. Water is involved in just about everything we do, which is why, you know, when... When I try to describe what it is that I do, it's kind of challenging because there are so many facets to it. And I think that's what originally fascinated me about it was when I started to realize, wow, water actually has the answers to all of life's toughest questions, all of humanity's toughest questions, water carries solutions for them. So it was about 2009, I'd say, um, when I first discovered the work of Victor Schauberger. And he was, they call him the water wizard. Basically, he was a savant of water. What Tesla was for electricity, Schauberger was for water. Brilliant, brilliant man. If he implemented even one of his ideas, it would radically transform um, our entire society as a whole. So he was involved in inventing free energy devices based on water and, and things like that. Um, and so that's when I really got introduced to the sentience of water and the consciousness of water and the power that's inherent in um, in every drop of water. You know, Victor uh, was known to say that there is more energy encapsulated in a single drop of water than um, a power station is able to produce. And so at that point, I was hooked. I was fascinated. I started reading everything I could over the next few years. Um, everything from, yeah, uh, well, my background is as a nutritionist and a health coach. So I also started reading everything about Might nutrition as well. and dehydration and um, how to really biohack our body waters. And um, yeah, that's kind of how it got started. And I started teaching about it about six years ago. And it's, yeah, it's been such a beautiful journey. I'm grateful. I, I after even after 12 years of working with water, I still learn something new about water every single day. Yeah. That's not an exaggeration. Every day I learn something new and I recognize that she's such a deep and profound mystery that I could study over the rest of my life and still barely scratch the surface. Absolutely. And I, I think one of the biggest misconceptions around water is that we just need to drink more. And like, when you look at where most people are living and where most of their water is coming from, like, particularly like in big cities, and then you've got these water reclamation plants that are taking toilet water and the prescription drugs that so many people are putting into their bodies. And then, and then they're just kind of like reprocessing that and sending it through either like plastic PVC pipes, or in some older cases, copper pipes. And, and then people are like, oh, I just need to drink more of that. Like, maybe you could explain how, uh, more is not necessarily better. Yes. Well, there are a few factors in this. So one is the difference between hydration and irrigation. So when we're talking about hydration, most people think, as you said, let's just drink more water, you know, eight glasses a day, I'm good to go. But that's just irrigation. We can irrigate ourselves all day long. It doesn't necessarily equate to how much water our body is going to absorb. And that has a lot to do with lifestyle factors how primed our cells are to absorb and retain hydration. Um, and then, as you mentioned, it also definitely comes down to water quality. And most of the water that people are drinking um, is actually dehydrating them. I know it sounds like an, a bit of an oxymoron to say that water can be dehydrating, but um, it would take even, you know, even if somebody is, is filtering their tap water fairly well and they have a reverse osmosis filter, for example, 
Reverse osmosis and distillation both create what hydrologists call an aggressive solvent, which means that because it's been stripped of everything, because it's empty, it has no more natural minerals left in it, it has no more natural microorganisms, it has no electrical conductivity. At that point, it's, it's not a conductor, it's an insulator, so it's not going to give us that electromagnetism in our body. It has no structure, it has no crystallinity, um, and so it becomes hungry, what Schauberger would call an immature water. So it can actually leach minerals from our bodies in that case, which means that over the long term, it's dehydrating. And I'm not crazy about the WHO, but they actually even warn against um, drinking reverse osmosis in the long term because of things like diuresis and heart disease. Mm -hmm. So in some cases, the water that people are drinking is is not only dehydrating them, but potentially um, contributing to states of disease, which is ironic because in its most vibrant and noble state, water itself is nature's primary medicine. It's the most mm -hmm. medicinal thing on this planet. Yeah. And I know a number of people who have <clears throat> just blindly sort of, or not necessarily blindly, but in, in with the best of intentions. And let's say those intentions are to like remove toxins from the water. They've switched to reverse osmosis and experienced health crises as a result, you know, because as you mentioned, if, if like water is supposed to have some of these natural minerals and electrolytes and, and things that our body needs. And when there's none of that, um, you know, even, uh, Aubrey Marcus, who's like one of, one of the founders of on it, he did years ago, uh, he, he did this like detox or cleanse where he only drank distilled water and he almost ended up in the hospital. Right. So like, it's, it's important to recognize that there are a number of different ways for us to, let's say biohack or improve our water or return water to its natural living form. And only one of them is filtration. We're going to get into some of those other ones, but like, if you are listening to this and you're using reverse osmosis or you're drinking distilled water, like you need to remineralize and, and get some of these electrolytes and minerals like back into the water. If you want it to be coherent with the uh the the fluids that are present in our body and our cells absolutely well it just comes down to the, the same factors that we look for in nutrition right we want our food to be as close to nature as possible we don't want highly processed food at one point in our history it was believed that highly processed food would be good for us because if you take wheat for example and you strip out all of the you know all of the molasses and all of the B vitamins and all of the, you know, soluble and insoluble fibers and, and all these different factors. And then you're just left with a pure white flour. And because it's so pure, that must be good for us. Right. And that was the belief at one point in time. And yet what we know Cause it's now easier is, to digest. Right. Supposedly. And so the same kind of, um, of, logic is involved when we say, oh, distilled water is best for us or reverse osmosis water is best for us because it's just highly processed. It's been stripped of everything that makes it a whole and well-rounded being. And as with, um, you know, cane sugar and white sugar or the coca plant and cocaine or anything else, we know that when you highly process something, it can turn um, a, a medicine into a poison. Mm -hmm. So all of the steps that we take to bring devitalized water back to life are just steps that aim to mimic natural processes in the first place. When you understand the hydrological cycle, you recognize that water herself is innately so extremely intelligent that she curates to her own natural balanced levels of aeration and oxygen content and hydrogen content and uh, mineral profile and all of these different factors, crystallinity, filtration, all of this that are necessary for water to be medicine. So we just want to mimic those processes and bringing her back to life if we can't get her directly from nature in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the, the, the books that brought a lot of this to my attention was The Fourth Phase of Water by, by Gerald Pollack. And it got me realizing like how much the water both in our bodies and that we're putting into our bodies is affected by the amount of electrical radiation in our environment. So like the, the smartphones that we're constantly using and that most people have on their bodies and the Bluetooth devices and the, wi uh, the Wi-Fi routers and the smart meters and all of this, like that affects and changes the structure of water and in turn can interfere with its ability to get into our cells where it can hydrate us at the cellular level and also its ability to then 
help our cells detoxify. Um, and, and in understanding like some of these mechanisms and how, just how unnatural we've made our environment, especially like if, if you're someone listening to this, that's living in a city, an area of high population density, which I believe is like, um, I don't know. I mean, I was mentioning to you before we started recording, like we just bought 65 acres in Western North Carolina because I want to be living in an area where there's super high life density, where I can drink natural spring water on tap. And if you, if you go back a few years, I'm living in a high rise in downtown Chicago. I'm like taking my water, I'm running it through a Berkey filter with like a, you know, a fluoride attachment. Then I'm vortexing it with minerals for like 27 minutes. And then I'm adding, um, you know, different things to not only remineralize it more, but also like to make it closer to some of the water that like the, and and give it the crystalline structure that like the Hunza people. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. Why don't I just drink spring water? You know? And I'm like, I'm going through this. It's like, every time I want to have, have a big drink, I'm doing a science experiment over here. And, um, and so that's sort of been the, the, the direction that I've migrated where conversely, I feel like as more and more people move towards cities, it's, it's almost an inverse of nature. It's, um, it's, it's making it so that, yeah, you could do that if you really wanted to biohack almost every aspect of your physiology, but at a certain point, it's going to become exhausting and it's incredibly inefficient energy wise, you know? So, um, if, if we haven't already explained, are, are there other reasons why you believe that almost hundred percent of the population is currently dehydrated? Well, currently the most conservative estimates say 75% of the population, but um, physicians like Dr. Zach Bush, um, I'm sure you've heard of him, triple board certified physician, brilliant guy. Um, yeah, he's awesome. With, yeah, he's incredible. He, he gives clinical evidence for um, a number that's much closer to 100% of people suffering from chronic dehydration. He's never had a single person come into his office whether regardless of whether they were feeling well or ill when they came in that had a healthy phase angle and a phase angle is basically a measure. That's what I was, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Mercola is a big, a big advocate of measuring phase angle. I was going to ask what is, what is the metric or the diagnostic tool that he's using? So yeah, he's, I'd love to get a device for measuring phase angle, but um, yeah. Okay, cool. Continue. Yeah. Yeah, So a healthy phase angle would be up around 10 or 12. That's really ideal health right there. Um, the general phase angle bell curve in the population is around six to seven. If you have around um, five or six, you're, you're suffering in some way. And what's interesting is um, that cancer patients tend to come in around 4.5 or below, which shows that at least from a hydration standpoint, cancer doesn't really happen until you're so dry that you're nearly dead. And, and I want to add a caveat here because um Yes, a low phase angle is associated with pretty much all disease states and pretty much all diseases have been traced back to some form of dehydration, but dehydration actually isn't what we think it is. So typically um, we think of how much water is in your body, but a more well-rounded definition of dehydration would include the state, the phase, the quality, and the composition of the water that's in your body. So even if you have a lot of, you know, you have plenty of water in your body, If it's not structured, if it doesn't have the right oceanic mineral profile, um, if it doesn't have electrical conductivity, if it has the wrong isotopes of hydrogen, that's a big one. If it's it's heavy hydrogen called deuterium rather than protium hydrogen, Mm -hmm. um, these are all factors that determine your level of hydration. So your phase angle would be measured by that. It's basically just um, an electrical impulse that they send in and they're able to measure how much water your cell membrane is able to bring across from intracellular, intracellular to extracellular fluids. And right. that's where you can measure your, your hydration level. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I did. Um, I did a three year, I actually ended up going like four months or so on like a <clears throat> deuterium depletion water protocol. And um, just this, this past year, and honestly, I'm not, I'm not sure if I noticed anything, but it's so gradual that it's, it's hard to say, but there's certainly a good amount of evidence that suggests that that's, uh, you know, an an intelligent move as part of a health protocol. Um, especially if you're suffering, especially if you have something like cancer, one of your serious illnesses, what, and what light waters were you drinking? I I was drinking, I think it's called light water, right? Oh, okay. The one from Russia. Nice. Yeah. 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 I ordered, 
Yeah, I was, uh, I, I ordered, um, like eight of those a month and then would just kind of gradually work them in over the week in certain amounts. And, uh, and then, yeah, I think I was on, and then I ended up getting it for uh, my friend, Russell Brunson as well. I sent him a bunch and, and he did, he did it during, um, and, and drank it exclusively. This was his idea, not mine, but he drank it exclusively during a five day water fast that that he was doing he drank only light water um I feel at that point i think he felt pretty good you know what i mean he's he's one of those guys that like always feels pretty good so there's not there's not a whole lot that like uh he, he notices particularly but i mean he's he's a machine um well, you know for anybody listening there yeah. are a lot of ways that you can of course you drink light water but there are a lot of ways that you can work with your diet to increase your your natural levels so what's called metabolic water, which is basically the ways the way that your cells produce water internally through, mm -hmm. um, well, there are two different processes there, metabolic Krebs cycle processes, and then there's a way that your DNA specifically produces um, water out of nothing, actually, in a way that scientists kind of don't even understand yet. It's, it's sort of miraculous. But either way, the water that it produces, that your cells produce, are um, it's deuterium depleted water. So dietarily, the higher... Um, your high quality fat intake is, the more you'll be producing, the higher your carbohydrate intake is, the less you'll be producing. I think it's something like for every 100 grams of fat that we consume, we produce about 110 grams of deuterium depleted metabolic water. And for every 100 grams of carbs that we eat, we end up producing, I think, only around 60 grams of metabolic water. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of fascinating aspects to water. And, and so, I mean, I, I guess this is a good time to ask you, are you, uh, do you follow a, a cyclical ketogenic diet for that purpose? Personally, I don't anymore. I used to play around with keto a bit, but I'm a traveler. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I've been kind of nomadic for the past two years. And mostly I just try to eat locally from the farms where I am. And, yeah, that's more how I am too. I never, I mean, I, I, I like certain aspects of, of the ketogenic diet, but I also feel like incredible when, you know, I'm 70, 80% vegan plant-based super high water content. Like I just, I just finished a, uh, a G8 from my buddy's company high vibe, which is like a superfood juicery here in town. It's all organic and it's got like cucumber, zucchini, celery, fennel, cilantro, romaine, kale, and mint in it. And, um, yeah. And obviously like, yeah, cold pressed, super high in their natural water content too. Some of it yeah, like still structured. It knows what it wants. I'm, I'm not really about imposing artificial structures of, you know, certain dietary protocols yeah, me on neither. the body anymore. She knows what she wants and she'll ask for it. And, and fruits and veggies are one of the best sources of hydration. In fact, if you eat an apple, you're going to absorb more water from that apple than you would from drinking a bottle of regular bottled water because that bottled mm -hmm. water isn't bioavailable. It isn't structured. Yeah. It's going to actually take more um, energy for your body to turn it into H3O2, which is bi bioavailable water, than, mm -hmm. it would, than you would actually absorb from the, from the energy right. you would absorb and from the water itself. H3O2 is what Gerald Pollock's talking about when he discusses the fourth phase of water, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And um, it's not technically a phase. Technically, yeah. it's an allotrope of water. But yeah. we call it the fourth phase. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Some some marketing and branding there as well. Yeah. Um, there are actually a lot of phases of water, though. It's pretty fascinating when you start getting into it. There's a plasma phase of water, which can actually turn into a laser fire in a laboratory. There's like super ionic and amorphous ice, which our sun is just full of. Our sun is full of water in the in the umbra and the sunspots. There are these phases of water that are found. And um, in the star nurseries where our sun was born, there's like enough water to fill the Earth's oceans 10 million times in these different nebula that are integral to the process of birthing stars. All over the universe, you find just countless different phases of water that are an integral part of, of every aspect of creation. Everything that the universe does, it needs water or hydrogen to do so. Hydrogen, of course, meaning in Latin, hydro water and gen creating. So what's fascinating yeah. to me is from the the molecular level of our health all the way to the very macro level of what is this universe that we live in, you see water mirrored and you actually see the same principles of water mirrored over and over and over again. So 
you know, your cells, each one of your cells is 70% water. You as a whole are 70% water. The earth is 70% water. 70% uh, of the condensed matter in our outer solar system is water. Our universe as a whole is 70% hydrogen, which is the creator of water. So the whole universe is just watersheds, nested within watersheds. And then if you want to mm -hmm. take a more granular look at it, you know, volumetrically, we're 70% water. But mm -hmm. molecularly, by molecular count, we're actually 99.95, between 99.89 and 99.95% water molecules. Yeah. Which means that for every thousand molecules in our body, 999 of them are water. And yet our our whole medical paradigm basically takes that remaining one molecule, the one um, solute in the entire solvent, and says that this one molecule is what's responsible for governing cell biology, mm -hmm. which is just so backwards. And the more we flip that on its head and we start looking at water primarily, the more medicinal um, therapies we're starting to find that are based in water. For sure. There's there's also a part of me that feels like, I mean, whatever you want to call them, whether you want to call them like the parasite class or, or the controllers or whatever, like, I feel like they recognize the importance of water and electricity in governing all life. And they weave it into all of our vernacular, all of our language in ways that make it so obvious. If you're paying attention, you know, you talk about like electricity, current currency, you know, they equate it to money, but like money really doesn't have any value or life. If you're, if, if, if you're struggling financially, you're under water. You know what I mean? If, if, if they, um, if they put all of your, uh, possessions on hold, you get your assets frozen. It's like the language that we equate with electricity and water ties to everything. Those two things are life. And yet we're, we're convinced through a lot of the, the Rockefeller based schooling system that, it, you know, we're taught otherwise that it's like, that we're like this ball of chemical reactions taking place. And if you, if you remove water and you remove electricity, nothing works. Absolutely. And if you look at our whole legal system, it's all based on maritime law. We're not even mm -hmm. considered real men and women standing on the land. Yeah. The moment that we, you know, sign away our birth certificate and our securities agreements when we're born. I mean, it's, it's surreal when you look at how deeply water is, is woven into everything. And you're absolutely right. The ruling class, whatever you want to call them, is so acutely aware of this that even Schauberger spoke about this well over a hundred years ago. He said that because water is the capital of capital, meaning water is the abundance on the planet bar none, there is no abundance without water. And your relationship to water is a direct correlation to your relationship to prosperity. You can't grow anything. You can't make anything. You can't sell anything. Your land is worthless without water. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the ruling class know this, and yet they also know that because within water is a supercomputer capable of infinite information storage and free energy generation and is capable of reproducing itself, so it doesn't have to be the scarce commodity that we've come to believe that it is, mm -hmm. those are the three most um, threatening factors to the, to the power structures that are in place, mm -hmm. free energy readily accessible to everyone, you know, free healthcare, readily accessible to everyone and the medicinal properties of, of water. And so that's why, according to Schauberger, any attempts to reveal the mysteries of water have been ruthlessly stamped out for hundreds of years. He said um, that there's been such censorship over water wisdom that you can look at very old books that have been published and then see that in later editions, all of the information about water was actually taken out mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I've certainly seen this in um, some of the, the scientific circles that I've rolled in. You have to be very careful when you're speaking about some discoveries around water to actually phrase them in certain ways to leave out the most interesting parts, right? You just kind of drop little hints in the research. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we're, we're going to get a little bit back into the mechanisms of water in a second, but I'm curious just because we're on this slight tangent that I encouraged and I'm glad we went here. Um, have you ever looked into, uh, airplanes and, and specifically like 
So an airplane, they'll say like a 747, the planes that we fly on, if you look up how much fuel they say is required on an airplane, it's uh, over 60,000 gallons. So they'll say like roughly 63,500 gallons of fuel are on a 747. If you look at what 60,000 gallons of fuel actually looks like, there is no physical way. It doesn't... no. <laughs> I love it. I love it. There's so much bullshit around that. You know what I mean? Oh, so yeah. what are these planes running on? And a lot of people may get upset, but it, I, you know, if you want to go ahead, but go look at what 60,000 gallons of fuel looks like, and then look at a plane and, and tell me where they put it. You know, is it in the wings? It's just, it's, it's, it's clearly a lie, right? What are your thoughts on that? What do you think so planes? Have? Right. <laughs> I don't think planes. No, <laughs> I don't think planes have that many gallons. There's no way. There's no way it would fit in the wings. It's just impossible. There's not. They're they're running on something else, and it probably involves some water. <laughs> it may. In fact, in um in World War II, the Germans were actually working on an airplane that ran entirely on water, mm-hmm. and they produced it. They completed it. Mm-hmm. No one knows what happened to it. Um, mm-hmm. There were actually two inventors in the 80s and 90s that created cars that ran completely on water a japanese guy forget his name and a guy named stanley myers brilliant mm-hmm. it would go 100 miles on a single gallon of water and it mm-hmm. could run on any kind of water i mean you could just river water ocean water distilled water rain water tap water it doesn't matter you just get a gallon of it put it in your car and you can run for 100 miles and all that it would put out as exhaust was oxygen and hydrogen was just based on electrolysis. Unlike these hydrogen fuel cell cars that they have now that are highly mm-hmm. explosive and not as sustainable as they claim to be. And yeah, Elon, and, Elon and Musk all. isn't doing anything impressive. Yeah, no, and on many levels. <laughs> um, but Stanley Myers was, was murdered. He, um, he was tracked down. They tried to buy his patents numerous times. He refused to sell them. And his very last words, he, he took a bite of something, you know, he took a sip of juice at a, at a restaurant and he stood up and clenched his neck and he said, I've been murdered. And he killed open and died. I think that's some powerful last words. Intense. Yeah. And these, these are the same people encouraging, encouraging you to put a diaper on your face and, and participate in medical experiments. So think about that folks. The same people <laughs> who are telling you that it's safe to drink tap water with fluoride and chlorine and chlorine yeah. and trihalomethanes, which by the way, when trihalomethanes volatilize, they become chloroform gas. So if you're in a shower, mm-hmm. it's not just what you drink. If you're showering in tap water, you're breathing in trace amounts of chloroform gas. Yeah. They have literally turned water into a weapon of war. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the the shower is one of the modern gas chambers, especially if you don't have a a, a filter. Which Mercola.com, you can go to Mercola.com. He's got some great shower filters, and I'm sure you know some other uh, some other good ones. I guess there's so many people that listening to this that are probably still drinking tap water. Um, can we elaborate a little bit more on why they shouldn't be? Gladly. Then this could be a whole hour long topic just in and of itself. So I'll try to keep it brief. Um, but as you mentioned, if you're living in a city, uh, you probably are drinking toilet water. <laughs> and there's They have a system that's called toilet to tap. It's actually a closed loop system where water comes in from businesses and homes, and then it gets filtered not very well and then sent back out to businesses and homes again. So in addition to the laundry list of chemicals that they put in there, like um, fluoride, chlorine, chloramine, trihalomethanes, DBPs, uh, disinfection byproducts, all of these various things, astrazine, all these things. In addition to all of that, they've also found that in most major cities, there are around 50 pharmaceuticals in the tap water. How did the pharmaceuticals get there? I mean, we're talking about um, a lot of uh, birth control medications, SSRIs, painkillers. Those are not filtered out at the plant. Some that may not be getting filtered out and some that some that could also be being put in. Who knows? Who knows? I'm not prepared to theorize about that. I don't know. I don't know either. I can't back that up. Honestly, I can't. As it is. Yeah, yeah, I can't back that up. Yeah, for sure. Because what is your pee? If if people are peeing out all of their all of their pharmaceuticals, your pee is filtered blood plasma, right? It's like blood plasma with urea and protein. So if you're drinking this in, you're drinking other people's filtered blood. It's just this weirdly vampiric system of mutual drugging, right? And all of these. 
pharmaceuticals have been tested one by one, just somewhat tested. I mean, like, <laughs> guidelines around the test. Yeah, I mean, but if one Fauci, by one, if, if Fauci's dose, involved. <laughs> I know, right? God knows what they're doing to puppies up there. Anyways, tap water is a bad idea, guys. But you know what? Even in large cities, you'd be surprised how close your nearest spring is. Even when I was living in New York City, I was living in Brooklyn, there was a spring on Staten Island. There's, there's a spring in L.A., you know, even if it takes you an hour to get there and back, who doesn't drive an hour to go to the airport? It's absolutely worth Bring it. Bring like five or 10 five gallon tank, uh, five gallon jugs and fill them up. Mm-hmm. And it's a good workout. You're going to the source. <laughs> You're going to the source of life, the point where life itself is birthed from the earth. It's really a communion. It's a pilgrimage. You can find those at, you can go to findaspring.com, find spring, type in com. your location, and then go there with some jugs. I've done that too when, when I was living in the city after. After I sort of realized some of this stuff, I was like, man, I better start going and getting some spring water. Or, you know, for a while I ordered Mountain Valley spring water, which is, you know, it's, it's all right, whatever. It's not, I mean, you're, you're not, you're not going to get excited about it, but um, it was better than the tap water that I was drinking. Right. Um, I, I'd like to hear a little bit more about your process now. And like, so let's talk about the process on like a meta level and then we'll get into um, more what you do on a daily, weekly basis for your water? Well, my strategy is actually relatively simple. It's a lot simpler than what I teach the folks who are on top water and can't get off it because I just go to spring wherever I am. doesn't matter where in the world I am. I will find the nearest spring and harvest my water and harvest as much as I can. And when you're drinking really high quality water, you actually need to drink less of it. You're less thirsty. You get more hydrated. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not filling up a five gallon carboy every week. It's not as daunting as it sounds. Your mm-hmm. body will preferentially choose the higher quality water. Yeah. Um, but insofar as I do need to let it sit for a little while, stagnation and heat are two of the biggest factors in water losing its structural coherence. So as the, um, the bonds, the hydrogen bonds loosen as it sits still, before I drink it, I, I want to bring it back to life again. So I'll do that either through a flow form or a vortex. And because every spring is a little bit different, um, I don't test the TDS of every spring that I drink from. That's a total dissolved solids. Because mm-hmm. um, some of them kind of, may be good. Yeah. Not all, not all of them are necessary. Some, yeah. some may be lower. It just depends on whether you have a softer water or a harder water. Mm-hmm. And I have I can kind of just taste that a little bit. So depending on whether or not I feel like I need more electrolytes than what that spring has, I might add some electrolytes back to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then aeration is important. That's another thing that happens when you pour it through a vortex or a flow form. Mm-hmm. Water is just like us. She has all the same basic needs that we do. She's a body just like we have our bodies that can either be healthy or sick, alive or dead. We need to breathe. She needs to breathe to absorb gases like oxygen and carbon acid. We need to move. We can't just sit still all the time without getting stagnant and unhealthy. She also needs to move. She needs to spin. She needs to tumble. She even just shaking your water. I mean, that's how they create structured water for um, homeopathic remedies. It's not the best method. Uh, vortexing is a lot better because it's nature's preferential method. Um, but really any movement is better than just letting it sit still and yet everything that we do to water in the modern world is exactly the opposite of that we put her through pressurized pipes at right angles we bottle her up with no aeration she sits still in these little water tombstones along the shelf so just take the opposite of what we we do to water in society and instead do what what nature does with water herself Mm -hmm. yeah I i love that approach another thing that i like to do is to incorporate magnetism and mm-hmm. electromagnetic frequencies. So mm-hmm. in nature, water is exposed to the geomagnetic influences of rock formations and aquifers. And when she rises to the surface, she's also exposed to just the ambient frequencies um, and lights and sounds and images of everything in her environment. So the sounds of birds and sunlight and moonlight and starlight there are actual studies showing that she responds to every single one of these stimuli. So this mm-hmm. is the difference between what Victor Schauberger called a mature water and an immature water. An immature water doesn't have these um, energetic, this energetic information. 
And so it's hungry. It will, it will suck up any information in its environment, even if that's electromagnetic field, it will be more susceptible to EMF toxicity. But if you fill your water with good information, it matures and it's going to carry that information, that vibration into your body. Yeah, I love it. And I, I like your sim simplistic approach, which is just wherever you are, drink spring water. And like, that was a big part. There's, there's this amazing um, <clears throat> little spot. that's like five minutes from where we got our land in North Carolina, where there's <clears throat> literally like a, a, a tube coming out of the mountain. That's just free flowing spring water. And um, <clears throat> one of the locals there showed it to me and I remember I was like, you can just straight drink this. I'm like, you're not going to get sick. And he's like, no, it's like straight out of the mountain. He's like, it's not exposed to any, like, I mean, you got to be careful. I'm um, just for anyone listening. Like you gotta be careful that they're, you're not getting spring water from a place where like animals could die or where, you know what I mean? There could be. Or where there's um, been any fracking. You got to check your, your environment. Yeah. There's a site called fracktracker.com to see if your local aquifer has been affected by that in any way. Yeah. It's definitely important to, to make sure it's a high quality spring, but most of them are. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. huge. Really and, safe. And, and this is the water that our ancestors have been drinking for millennia. I mean, mm -hmm. longer, millions of years, so even since before we were homo sapiens, all living beings drink water from the earth. We're the only beings on earth that don't drink water from the place where we are. We drink water from Evian, France and from Fiji and from mm -hmm. all over the world. And how much more grounded and centered and present would we feel if we were drinking water from the place where we are that carries the information, the intelligence of our own watershed. You know, our, our bodies are drops of water that come from the watershed where we're from. Our, the water in our bodies used to be in a river. It used to be in a cloud. And when we pass away, it will go back to the watershed again. So regardless of how divorced our modern lives are from the watershed, we're integrally woven into it. And because your water, your body water is so tied into your psyche, the quality of your mind, the quality of your emotions, um, your, your, your thoughts and your perceptions, all of these are patterned by the quality of the water in your body. And so when there's more coherence, not only in the structure of your body water, but also the rootedness, the groundedness of coming from your home, the place where you are, there's just this sense of reciprocity and communion that is invaluable it's absolutely invaluable because water is intelligent it's it's it is intelligence itself it's been said that water is the glove on the hand of consciousness and she's the most intelligent and ancient thing in the entire universe you know mm -hmm. for every single cluster of water molecules there are 440 thousand panels on it at minimum that's just the smallest measurement that we can measure um realistically if we had higher you know better equipment we would see that in a fractal in a way, there are an infinite number of panels per every cluster of water molecules. Every single one of those panels is responsible for sensing, storing, and transmitting information, vibration, and frequency about its environment. And so it's constantly perceptive to absolutely everything, and it's constantly communicating those perceptions as well. Theodore Schwenk, one of my favorite researchers, um, said that water is the sensory organ of the earth. And so when you see water, she's also seeing you. When you taste water, she's also tasting you. And so there's the opportunity to enter into this communion, this communication with liquid intelligence itself. It's it's really the memory of, of the earth, the remembrance of every everything, even from the farthest reaches of the cosmos where water first comes from, it's still carried in every cluster of water molecules. And um, in fact, the word memory itself comes from the Greek word mem, which means water. So you're interacting with the physical form of consciousness itself when you interact with water. And when yeah. it comes directly from nature, there's this communion with the natural world that puts you so much more in harmony and in sync with natural rhythms, syncs up your circadian rhythms, helps you to feel more grounded and more peaceful. It's the most powerful um, all around, not just medicine on a on a physical level but mind body and the spirit you know there's a in colorado there's a um psychologist and psychiatrist she's both who uh, named dr sarah van anroy who treats dehydration first in all of her clients and she has shown that 
hydration protocols alone. And notice I'm saying protocols. It's not just drinking more water. It's eating Mm. a more hydrating diet, having a more hydrating lifestyle and drinking higher quality water is as effective. And in some cases, even more effective than psychiatric pharmaceuticals, even in conditions as severe as bipolar disorder. So it's nature's antidepressant. It's really nature's solution to Mm -hmm. every one of life's conundrums because it is life itself. And I know that was a bit of a tangent, but (laughs) Uh, it's relevant. It's relevant though. And migraines as well. You know, one of the, one of the protocols for migraines. And again, this is like not all water is created equal. So we're not talking about like when we say, I mean, there's a protocol for if, if you're dealing with migraines or headaches to drink uh, a glass of water every five or 10 minutes until, you know, you've had at least like five or 10 glasses of water. And a lot of times that's enough to get rid of the headache. Now it's different if we're talking about tap water versus like spring water here. So keep that in mind as, as you listen to this, but um, it, it also becomes fascinating when you realize that we don't really know where memories are stored in our body. And there's all sorts of cases where people have had like deep tissue work and, and, and myofascial release and body work. And then they'll have a memory come up from like their childhood or like a trauma that they experienced that may have been stored in the tissue. And you wonder, is it possible that water plays an integral role in our memory? And that some of these conditions, especially the neurodegenerative conditions and the memory related conditions like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and dementia may be very much connected to dehydration, devitalized water, and the fact that we are <clears throat> in a, essentially destroying our water with Wi-Fi, cell phones, smart meters, you know, these eye of Sauron 5G towers that are going up all over the place. Um, it's being put up on water towers. On what tons of water towers. Look at yeah. look at your local water tower. It probably has 5G uh, antenna on it right and now. Water is an amplifier of frequencies. And so mm-hmm. it's just amplifying that 5G even more. As is Not as is our bone. Yeah. 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 And and 5G is or just EMFs in general are a huge mm-hmm. factor of, of hydration, not just for the way that they affect our drinking water, but of course the way that they affect our body water. The mm-hmm. reason why they're so detrimental to our health is because of the way that that they affect our body water. You know, water is a dipole, meaning it has a north pole and a south pole, and exposure to certain uh, electromagnetic frequencies can cause a rapid reversal of that polarity. Sometimes mm-hmm. a billion times per second, these poles can flip back and forth. That's not stable. It's not healthy. It also causes um, your cell membranes to short out their charge so that you then cannot absorb water. So even if you're drinking the highest quality water, if you're in the presence of strong man-made EMFs at the time, your body might not be able to absorb those because you're shorting out the frequency of the cell membrane. Also, Mm -hmm. your gap junctions can start to resonate at the wrong frequency as well. They're like these, under a microscope, they look like these long fiber optic cables that um, transfer cell signals um, from one cell to the next without ever exiting into the extracellular matrix um, and into the cytoplasm. So it can uh, cause those to resonate at the wrong frequency. So Mm -hmm. at every level, and it can cause your, you were talking about fascia, it can cause your fascia to dry out. What we found is that fascia is actually one of its main purposes in the body is to deliver hydration to every single cell. Fascia is connected to every single cell. And when you look at it under a microscope, when you look at living fascia, well, it's 80% water and 20% uh, proteins and collagen. And you can actually see this beautiful, these beautiful gel-like webs, these little strings. And you can watch the water droplets slide across the web as the fascia delivers hydration to every single one of your cells. And much like your lymphatic fluid, you have three times more lymph in your body than you have blood. And yet the lymphatic fluid is so often overlooked. But just like your lymphatic system, your fascial system is also hydraulic network. Hydraulic literally means movement of water or movement by water. And so your fascia can only deliver this hydration in as much as you move. If you're sitting still, if you're stagnant, your fascia can't deliver that hydration to your cells. And so these areas start to dry out and they start to deaden and they start to harden. And the same thing happens if you have a traumatic injury, 
whether that is a physical injury, or as you were mentioning, it can even be a trauma or an emotional injury that happens or some kind of psychological harm that happens, you'll find that that gets stored in the fascia and that that area of the fascia starts to become um, become drier and starts to weave itself together in these tighter patterns that the water can't quite get into as well. And so your emotions can't flow. I mean, water equates, again, equates to your psyche and equates to your emotions. So if those waters aren't flowing, you're going to be holding on to stuck, stagnant emotions in those areas too. Yeah, This is why the number one most important factor other than drinking water when it comes to hydration is movement because movement is necessary to deliver the hydration into your cells. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and that can be simple. Like there's a lot of people that are dealing with injuries. I mean, not to go on a tangent, but some of those injuries may even be caused by like, we see a lot of people with, um, you know, injuries to their, uh, joints, ligaments, connective tissue that can be dehydration. In, in, in and of itself, right? And like collagen and, and water that is not functioning properly in the body. Um, Even concussions. You're yeah. so much more prone to get concussions if you are if you play sports of any kind, if you're yeah. dehydrated, that you just don't have a cushion in your brain. Literally. Yeah, especially MMA fighters whose job is to like not get knocked out. You know, if they're dehydrated going in, like a punch that would normally not affect them in the same degree could make them unconscious if they're dehydrated. Right. And if they're doing these crazy weight cuts that they do mm-hmm. beforehand, where they drink a bunch of water and then they drink a bunch of salt water and then they go on a dry fast, or I don't know what the protocol is exactly, but they're basically completely dehydrating themselves mm-hmm. to cut out water weight. Yeah. I imagine that would make them much more prone to concussion. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, over the years, like some of the tools that, that I've utilized, I'm, I'm going to want to hear about some of your tools, but like, I, you know, I mentioned, uh, a Berkey filter. I've used an aqua true as well. Um, and then remineralized with, um, like the Quinton hypertonic solution. And, um, I've used some of Dr. Patrick Flanagan's epic. We could go on a whole rabbit hole, just talking about that alone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, let's, I guess let's talk about that in just a second, but, um, Dr. Patrick Flanagan, he's got some great products that, mm-hmm. that I've used on and off like mega hydrate and crystal energy, um, sort of mimicking like the, the, the aspects of the water that we see in some of these blue zones with the longest living people like the Hunza, where he recognized that they had a much higher silica content in their water. And that helped support the the, the crystalline nature of the water and, and help that water get into our cells. Like it made the water wetter, you know, um, per Dr. Patrick Flanagan. Um, what are some of your essential tools? If, if, if someone is not drinking spring water, like we get it. That's, that's the best. That's what you and I have both migrated towards and what I think the future is. And honestly, like if you're still living in an area of super high population density in a city, and maybe you need to because of a job, or maybe you want to, because of a, of a lifestyle preference, I don't think that's the best long-term thrival technique, but, um, strategy I should say. But, um, if someone doesn't, if someone isn't drinking spring water, what are like, uh, Isabel's essential tools for remineralization and structure and, and filtration and, and some of your like six step process. Um, you know, what are some things like our listeners like to pick stuff up that can help them optimize themselves in mind, body, and spirit, you know? So what are those things? For sure. Well, there are so many and they really range. There's a whole spectrum from if you just want one machine that does it all, which I don't entirely recommend because I think the most important factor of what we do with our water is establishing relationship and communion. So doing these things manually helps you to spend time with your water, to invest your consciousness and your energy in water. Mm -hmm. You can always do that after using this all-in-one machine. So if you just want to get the best of the best, um, you know, for years, people asked me for what my top recommended filter was, and I didn't have one that I was really, really in love with because mm-hmm. all of them required that you add something or do something thereafter. But I've recently discovered this one that I love. It's called Spring Aqua. And you can use the code water is life and get a free shower filter that comes with it. Which there is really you go. Great. So you just set up your whole house that way. That solves two problems. Right. <laughs> and what I love about it is that it's it filters the water of everything fluoride everything um and it also structures the water it also mineralizes the water but best of all 
it adds molecular hydrogen to the water. Mm. And it does so without Gosh. electrolysis. Mm. It's the only machine that I know of that does so without electrolysis. I'm not a fan of electrolysis. We do not want to electrocute our water, all of these so ionizers. You're, you're talking that are about there. like like the um some of the there's very popular machines out there that Kongen and yes. things like that. Yeah. And not not a fan. No, on, on many levels for many reasons. Um mm-hmm. one of which is is the the electrolysis that they do. So I, we, I had a Kongen machine. Water, uh, in in, in 2015 it's in a box right now uh i used to drink it too back in like 2008 2009 you know i really yeah. fell for the company hype the company rhetoric it's, yeah. it's very convincing but when you peer behind it and we can go down that rabbit hole too as well and just you know bust that whole story apart because it doesn't hold any water <laughs> <laughs> Bring on amazing. You're, you're, you're punny isabel <laughs> <laughs> so the spring aqua adds molecular hydrogen that's actually stabilized in the water without electrolysis. And hydrogen, um, as Dr. Albert St. Georgi said, he was a Nobel Prize winner. He said, hydrogen is really the fuel of life. And it's so true. And mm-hmm. The more hydrogen is in your water, the more hydrating it is. So mm-hmm. that's my favorite. It costs about as much as a condom filter would. Um, mm-hmm. So it's out of some people's price range. In my course, one of my courses, the Navigating the Waters one, I go through all of the DIY methods, everything from free, do it yourself. It's going to take a long time and a lot of elbow grease, but you can make it happen. Um, And then, but I would say like another uh, mid-range option, my two favorite um, mid-range options would be the vortexing and structuring the natural action Portable mm-hmm. structure. They also have um, whole home devices. Those, those that are like 200, 300 bucks, right? Yeah, for the portable one. It's super mm-hmm. reasonable. And if you use the code water is life 10, you get 10% off. Um, and that applies to their whole home structures as well. So if you're a homeowner, just stick in one of these, you got structured water right there. It's great. Um, Do you think that also- when you're going to structure your water, like you like using a natural action technology is portable, for example, if do you want to run tap water through that or do you want to filter it first and then run it you through? You want to it? filter it first. Yeah, I so agree. my process, if you're using tap water, is filter, structure, balance, bless, and free. And then lifestyle is kind of a sixth bonus one. So okay. if you're using a spring aqua, you've got the first ones filter, structure, and balance. And I would say even bless because that's kind of similar to energize and the spring mm-hmm. aqua energizes the water as well. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Yeah. So those are the methods. So if you're skipping, so if you're just going straight to the natural action or the Mayu, just structure, then that's after filtration. And again, I'm not crazy about most filters, but how do you spell Mayu? M-A-Y-U. The aqua tree was the decent filter. It's reverse osmosis. So you have to remineralize, you have to structure. It will take crap out. If you're only interested in taking crap out, that's a good one. You can get that yeah. from um, waterandwellness.com. And again, you can use the code water is life for that for discount as well. I'm all about helping people up with, <laughs> with the water tech. My yeah. you also coupon code water is life. It, that one is beautiful. That one's really elegant. It creates a, a beautiful vortex that you can watch. And, um, you know, Theodore Schwank, again, um, one of my favorite researchers showed that water is most sensitive while it's moving. So it's really movement that opens up the sensory um, perceptions of water. And so when you're blessing your water, when you're praying over it, when you're exposing it to solfagio tones or music or speaking kindness over it or asking it for a certain uh, medicinal property, as a lot of uh, indigenous tribes do, there's so many ways of communing and blessing your water. It's best to do that Mm -hmm. while it's moving. Mm -hmm. So that's filter and structure. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, please continue. So filter and structure and then balance, um, that's a lot of different factors. So it's the electrolyte profile of the water, which my favorite electrolytes, as you mentioned, uh, Canton Marine Plasma is an amazing one, especially the isotonic. It's also the mm-hmm. hydrogen content. So I like to add hydrogen tabs to the water as well. Um, you like isotonic also- better than the hypertonic? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Because it more closely resembles our own our own uh, body water, so our our bio water is basically marine plasma. It has the exact same mineral ratios as the ocean did 
um, back in the Cambrian period when vertebrates first left the ocean. We're only able to walk on land because we carry the oceans with us because our ancestors mm. carried the oceans onto land in our bloodstreams. And so when we return to those mineral ratios that the ocean has, we return to health. So that's one of the factors of dehydration is your mineral profiles go off. Canton is great because um, it's basically like the primordial soup, right? It's everything, or just a concentrated broth of everything that your body needs. It has the entire periodic table of elements. I mean, whales and dolphins will swim thousands of miles just to feed on this one annual vortexing plankton bloom where they harvest it. And it's actually pharmaceutical grade. It used to be a pharmaceutical listed in the physician's desk reference until it started threatening some pharmaceutical companies and I had to take it out because they were finding that it was curing conditions, even severe genetic abnormalities. It had a curative rate of over 90%. When Canton set up, he set up like 69 free clinics in Europe and Africa, and they treated such a range of issues. I mean, even women who had given birth to um, deformed children and had had several stillbirths, they started having healthy babies for the first time. They started treating people who had genetic abnormalities um, that Western medicine writes off as completely incurable and seeing success rates with those. Now, that's for intravenous QMP and I don't know about the legality of taking it intravenously anymore, but at least taking it orally, you can get these beautiful little glass ampules and do it that way. My second favorite for electrolytes is Minbiotics, also from Natural Action. And I would recommend this to anyone who is still saving up to get a filter, because not only does it add minerals back to the water, but it can also filter out contaminants, just a broad spectrum of contaminants in a really beautiful way. You'll notice um, the more contaminated your water this is, the more contaminated your water is, you'll see a little um, a fine yellow sediment settle on the bottom of the water, pulls out the contaminants and actually neutralizes them. So that's a great option. And it um, has anti-radiation properties as well. It was actually discovered in... Um, near Hiroshima, Japan, by a researcher who was studying how to mitigate some of the effects of the radiation damage there. And he discovered this um, incredible stuff oozing out of a rock that was under a tree that was thriving in an area where everything else was dead. And then, of course, they put it through laboratory processes to, to refine it down um, yeah. and make it more medicinal. It was really amazing stuff. That's cool. And I, I may have missed it because you mentioned Aqua True. Is that is did you say that was your favorite filter, or is there something else that you like better? The spring aqua is my favorite filter. The spring aqua is your best. Okay. Yeah. That's but that's if you your... want to spend about 10% of the price and then you're really committed to structuring and balancing and blessing it after the fact, because spring, you know, the um the aqua true is is great for taking stuff out, but it's also going to destructure it. It's also going to demineralize it because mm -hmm. it's reverse osmosis. Totally. So, totally. Yeah, it's a good first step. I love it. I love it. And you've created a course on this and a whole bunch more that, um, mm -hmm. that walks people through it and gives them like the different levels based mm -hmm. on where they're at financially. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that and like who that's for and uh, where they could pick it up. Yeah, so the, that's the Navigating the Waters course, and that's basically an overview of all of the different kinds of waters that we encounter and how they affect our bodies and our minds very differently, and then how to take any one of them and turn it back into spring quality water. Um, using those six steps um, and also, yeah, with just a range of options based on how much time and energy you want to invest in the process. Yeah, and where's that at? Mm -hmm. So that's at waterislife.teachable.com. Right now I have three courses up there. That's the one that's about drinking water. And the other two are all about bio water and biohacking your body ecology and how our internal waters near the external waters of the earth. That one's more for like um, nutritionists and healthcare providers and anyone who's just really a health nut and wants to dive deep into, you know, deuterium depleted metabolic waters and the crystallinity of your intracellular and extracellular fluids and optimizing your lymphatic drainage, just all of that. Kind of stuff. I love it. I love it. Anything else that you would like to share that you feel called um, to speak on at, at, at this point in time and space? I think the only thing that I want to say is just that water is life and water is a sentient being. 
And when we shift our relationship to water, everything else shifts from there. It's a cascade effect. It ripples out into every part of our lives and it starts from that primary relationship, that primary reciprocity, needing water in a new way, communing with water in a new way, recognizing her, her autonomy and her brilliance and her sanctity. And so I would really invite everyone who is listening to just meditate on that a little bit and percolate on it. And next time you take a sip of water, at the very least, love her and thank her and respect her and see where it goes from there. And I, I also just it. want to say thank you so much for inviting me on here to come and chat with you. Yeah, thank you for coming. This has been a great conversation. I have one more question just before we bring it home. And guys, check out waterislife.teachable.com and, uh, and, and dive deep in this stuff because it is one of, if not the most important biohacks for upgrading your physical and mental performance. Um, if you were to speak on what you believe to be either God or the creator or the universe's plan for humanity these next few years, um, how do you see things unfolding? I think we're at this incredible choice point right now where there are just so many splitting timelines and each one of us has the sovereignty within our own soul to determine how our own personal timeline unfolds. We live in an infinite universe. There are infinite quantum realities existing simultaneously. And I think that this point in time is really, at least in my perspective, it's really an invitation to step into our sovereignty and interconnectivity at the same time. And when we do so, we open all kinds of possibilities that aren't bound by the constraints of all of the, the mandates and seemingly imprisoning systems that are uh, encroaching right now. Mm -hmm. I think the answers lie within us and lie within our own lives. Beautiful. Isabel, thank you so much for your time. I've enjoyed our conversation. And uh, yeah, you're welcome back anytime. This was a this was a great conversation. Thank you so much. This was really fun. Thanks. Bye guys. Say hi, greetings.